we're starting um, our all speaker panel. Uh, everybody gets to make a brief statement uh, on your work or on uh, the, the conference, on your co what you've heard from your colleagues uh, about the weekend, really, and um, and your, in your own your own work. And then uh, we'll open it up to uh, open discussion and, and Q and A. People will ask some questions for anybody and some questions for specific folks, so feel free to do that as well. So with that in mind, then um, you told me don't start with you. <laughs> Please start on the other end. Okay. Well, Jesse actually, Jesse, Jesse Jarnow uh, was the far first speaker, really, so it makes sense for him to go first. So we'll go down this way if you don't mind. Hi. Uh, um, my name is Jesse Jarnow. I'm the author of a recent book called Heads, a biography of psychedelic America, and I guess my overwhelming interest is in kind of the continuity of, of what's sort of rudely called underground use over the last 50 years in this country. Uh, hi, my name is Fred Tomaselli. I'm an artist and um, I guess I'm very interested in uh, perception and altered, spa uh, altered uh, states and, in art and the sociology that it, uh, uh, is around it. And uh, for those who are interested, I do have a work up right now at uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art uh, in a show called uh, Dream States, and I have an installation up at uh, Mass Mocha in, uh, uh, for those in the area who want to see stuff for real. Um, I'm Bob. You just heard what I care about. <laughs> uh, I'm Sarah. I'm a postdoc at NYU School of Medicine, and I'm um, interested in learning and memory, neuroplasticity, uh, basic science involved in the therapeutic potential of psychedelic drugs. Hi everyone, I'm Samantha Padraberic, and I'm a clinical research coordinator with the NYU team. Um, so I'm involved in coordinating the psilocybin for alcohol dependence trial, and I'm also very interested in altered states of consciousness um, and the therapeutic potential of peak transcendent states. Uh, I'm Steve Ross, I'm an addiction psychiatrist, and I direct the NYU psychedelic research group. I'm Rick Doblin from MAPS, and I was thinking lately that we have all sorts of new psychedelic research taking place with practically everything but the one thing that's not happening is psychedelic research into psychic phenomena and ESP and so last night between three and four in the morning <laughs> I, I talked to a potential donor who says he wants to fund research with psychedelics and ESP I knew you were going to say that, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kenneth Topper, adjunct professor in the School of Population and Public Health at the University of British Columbia, and I'm interested in both the therapeutic and cognitive enhancement potential of psychedelics and entheogens. I'm Jessica Nielsen. I'm a neuroscientist at UCSF, and I just kind of want to do a shameless plug of the survey. It would be nice to get more participation, so if you could go to the MAPS website, and if you have experience taking ayahuasca, um, I'd really appreciate your participation. My name is Beatriz Labache, or Bia Labache. I'm Brazilian. I live in Mexico, in Guadalajara, and I'm an anthropologist. I study traditional drug use and interface with contemporary urban uses. Uh, Roland Griffiths from Johns Hopkins. We do clinical research with uh, psilocybin. I, I just want to say that this has uh, been a marvelous get together, and it's it's great for me as a laboratory guy who's uh, going over spreadsheets and data and managing studies to to pull out and see this large and very complicated and picture in this growing community. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jag Davies. I'm the Director of Communication Strategy at the Drug Policy Alliance, which is the nation's leading organization promoting drug policies grounded in science, compassion, health, and human rights. We will be uh, having an event uh, the week after next at Columbia Journalism School called White Faces, Black Lives, Race, Reparative Justice, and the Era of a Gentler War on Drugs. So check that out if you're interested. Yeah. I am Natalie Ginsberg, and I work as the policy and advocacy manager at MAPS. Um, and I wanted to say that I've been really encouraged by how many of you have come up to speak to me about the role that psychedelics can potentially play in healing social injustice, something I care deeply about and I hope to continue talking to many of you about. Um, my name is Alicia Danforth. I'm a psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm a psychologist and researcher. My current research is on uh, MDMA-assisted therapy for social anxiety with autistic adults. Before that, I worked on a pilot study with Charles Grove in LA on um, uh, psilocybin for existential anxiety related to um, uh, advanced cancer. And I just want to thank this audience for being so good at asking questions. It's really been a pleasure. So, thank you. <laughs> Yay. Yay, audience. So before we get started with the questions, I just want to remind everybody, you know, like Jim Fadiman says, a question is an interrogative that ends with your voice going up. <laughs> and so um, if you do want to make a statement, we appreciate your contribution, but keep it extremely brief, one sentence if you please, and questions. Uh, here's a question. Julie, stand up please and hold the mic high. Thank you, Dr. Goldsmith. Oh, you're I'm welcome, with Dr. Operating Holland. Microphone. Um, thanks, everybody, for great presentations. A couple things kept coming up today that I thought were uh, intriguing, and we don't always talk about this in, amongst us. Uh, it's this idea of keeping it secret, that there's something about a religious ritual. You don't have to tell everybody your business. And Bob, you talked about um, the 12-step groups being about attraction more than promotion. And I wanted to maybe ask uh, several of you, and also Ellen Sparrow, um, how do you, okay, given that, that maybe we do want things to be a little underground, a little secret, and not so uh, promotional, how do we navigate uh, psychedelics being so much more a part of uh, scripted television and feature films and documentaries? And I was particularly interested because, Bia, you sort of brought up this, maybe we should keep it a little secret, um, and you're partnering with a documentary who's... <laughs> Um, and I was also wondering, was this, Ellen, was this going to be um, episodic, like you were going to do perhaps more than one? So I just, not to put you guys on the spot, but... Spot. <laughs> I was hiding, keeping it secret for a change. Okay, yeah, I'll stand up. Um, the, <clears throat> the film that I'm working on with Bia is going to be two things. One is a, a film, a feature film, and also um, a web series after we release it that way, an episodic thing that hopefully would go on and on and on, um, because I think this field is just endless, fascinating terrain for exploration and for sharing with people in a way that's responsible and intelligent and heartfelt. And there's a lot of superficial media. I think it was just mentioned in the previous presentation about all the weird stuff you can find on YouTube. Um, so, but but this is a dilemma and also an interesting friction that be a creative friction that we have in making this project is how deep she's going to go in her own personal story and of course I'm pushing for deeper and she's resisting and that's a kind of a cool dynamic and you know I'm used to this so the longer we work on it the more you're going to see me win this little. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Um, so uh, now, we have two microphones up there. You should have two. One was off the podium and one's in your hand. And so you got to get fast at passing back and forth if you don't mind, because we're here in the audience with the other microphones. Anybody have a comment or uh, contribute? Bia, of course. Well, uh, this, what I wanted to point out about integration is I think that you know it's part of our reflections as scholars to 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 be critical, and I think that some things are just becoming a cliche. And my my comment was to provoke some thought on that idea that integration, integration, integration. I think my whole take is why don't we try to look at what these people are doing traditionally and learn from that authority? And I think that sometimes this is taken for granted, and we just like automatically jump in, you know, these things are integrated in their societies and we don't have integration, therefore we have to create integration. But I think we can look at what they are doing and, and learn from those ways, still uh, in this, you know, uh, with this alterity, but there are things that are useful for us. And the other thing is I, I think it's the emergence of this kind of mishmash that what is therapy? Because if you take ayahuasca and then after, after that, for me, it's a kind of torture also because of language issues, because if I go in some other language, and then after I ask, everybody's sitting on a circle saying what they experienced, and people go into a, 
you know, great level of detail, I just feel like saying, somebody that didn't feel awe, compassion, and gratitude can have some, something to share, because people, uh, you know, repeat a lot of the same things. So is this therapy, like, having everybody a verborage of things, repeating sort of common things that are hard to express because of language, talking after a session, is this really therapy? Sharing is therapy, what is therapy? And what is integration? And I just want us to think more, you know, critically about, and, and this think about, of course it's a paradox, if we are all promoting ayahuasca and psychedelics by doing our work, like we are in a way, if we want this to be secret, perhaps we should vanish and not do what we do, because our work inherently is part of this expansion. And I think this is a great paradox. And about sharing my personal story, that's a conflict because Ellen wants me to say, I, I had this, you know, I had this and I, I saw that. I don't want to say that because that's mine. I don't want to say that on the camera. Everybody's like claiming that psychedelics is going to change the world, save the Amazon, save our species, transform consciousness, make us a better, you know, community and humanity. And I am this cynical person that I don't really think that's really true. I can't state that it has helped me. I better say that I think I would be worse without it. <laughs> that's how I put it. Uh, but I think that for me, it's about human rights. It's about not criminalizing. It's about our right to have sovereignty over our, our bodies. I prefer this kind of political human right. I'm not into the messianism that ayahuasca will save the world because I've just been too much around the ayahuasca communities. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments? Yeah, so I, I mean, I think to kind of expand on what Bia was saying, something that we might think about is maybe redefining what integration is. So integration doesn't necessarily have to be an outward conversation with somebody else. There can, there's a lot of room for, for personal, private integration. Um, and so perhaps there might be ways um, to sort of redefine what that means and make it a little bit more um, of a personalized thing because I think one of the beautiful things about psychedelics and their therapeutic potential um, is that they seem to be highly personalized in their effects. And so I think kind of trying to force them all into this one model is, is perhaps doing them a disservice and, and it is necessary to sort of do that for the, for the point of science. Um, but nonetheless, I think that there are, are other ways of integrating to be explored that, um, that might suit each individual more, uh, more personally. I'd like to share a view of integration as <clears throat> a lifelong process. Could be entheogenically informed or not. Um, it'll take a little work on your part. The invitation is to read the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. That's integration. I'll just make a comment. We're, we're also living in a moment uh, where the collapse between public and private is happening partly because of te technology and, and the public-private distinction arose partly out of the printing press and now with the, the rise of the internet uh, and the publicity around everything that used to be private uh, increasingly is, is sort of shifting the ground under which we're sort of used to being, uh, coming out of the sort of literate culture. And uh, Bob, your, your comment about the, the salvia, kids uploading their salvia videos, I and mean, that goes back uh, over 150 years with uh, nitrous oxide when it was kind of used for entertainment purposes. On stages much, much like this one, in uh, 1850s and 60s, people would come up and take nitrous and do crazy things and it was entertainment for people. So you... It's got a long history. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, you know, I want to identify Julie Holland as the person who asked that question. Uh, Julie is, first of all, uh, a friend of Horizon. She's spoken here, I think, twice, or at least once, and she's the author of The Pot Book and uh, Moody Bitches, I think the most recent one, and The Ecstasy, Ecstasy, The Complete Guide. She's a psychiatrist here in New York, and one of the few, you know, credentialed, professional psychiatrist who's just so knowledgeable and so helpful to the community. So anyway, thank you, Julie. I wanted to recognize you. Thank you. So we have another question. Thank you. Psychedelics helps to see the situation from different, from different point of views. And we 
on Earth have multiple um, centers of force. There's um, the they pursue it, this uh, the pursuit of power, different kind of power. There's military power. There's financial power. There's a power of over the um, over the tactics situation, like. The people who buy guns, they want to be exerts power over the tactic, you know, over you know lives of others. So these 300 million guns in United States. So we have different, and there's also uh, the um, uh, medical complex, medical pharmaceutical complex, also exerts some kind of power over the the whole situation. How the Population behave, you know what they have to do in case of. So the case, question is, uh, uh, w what kind of power you exert over these centers of power? Thank you. How do you think? Did you hear the question? I the last one. Did you hear the question? Can you, can, you, you can you repeat a little bit? I'm having we get a lot of echo up here. Uh, so what is what's the place of this community in this world? You know, in in general, with the different powers, over over the progress, over the over the future. What what, what exactly do you mean by? Are you saying powers? Yep. What. What, okay, so let's have a conversation about what the question is. <laughs> so, I mean, are, are we talking about kind of what 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 uh, powers are available to us to make change? No, I think he's trying to trying to tease out to what extent you control orthodoxy in the um, in, in the community. Oh, that's a good question. To what extent do you I control orthodoxy in the community? I mean, I think, in all honesty, I think all of the, everyone up here has a lot of different specialties and everything that, that we all do is interrelated and dependent on each other. So I do think each one of us in our respective fields has kind of a unique um, power, if you will, over um, influencing each other and the directions that we take. And so that's, that's fine. I'll add something too, and this is um, kind of going off of something that came up in Ken's talk um, when someone asked about these substances being tools versus teachers and I think if we talk about the concept of power this is actually a, a tool to empower individuals and I think when we think about them as, as teachers that is less empowering to an individual because it almost externalizes the potential that an individual has to develop or transcend um, or do whatever the person needs to do to be in their power so um, yeah I think it is an empowerment tool that comes through community but is all you, know, you might even say facilitator rather than tool because you know it facilitates something inside you that's already there rather than using a tool to to create something it's even more internal if in fact that it's it's so much the healing process from inside us rather than anything outside so many people try to meditate or do psychedelics or whatever it is to create their their change and until they realize that's not where it comes from they don't really create their change uh, other comments? Bia, you had a comment, yes? No? Other comments? Other questions? There's a question way in the back. An eager question. Hi. Hi. Um, in the last two years of my life, I found two things that really changed my outlook on the world, um, and that was activism and psychedelics. And I've been thinking a lot about the intersections of these, and I was wondering if anyone else had thought about it. Yes, the answer is yes. Well, I think a lot about power and about activism and about psychedelics, and I think that, <laughs> um, and, and I think we have an awful lot of power um, that we don't always recognize. And we have connections, I mean, we are incredibly well connected to the centers of power. And we've been able to mobilize um, senators, multiple senators and members of Congress to um, end the monopoly on the production of marijuana that's been in existence since 1968. Um, the, 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 the DEA just tried to criminalize 
uh, Kratom. And the community mobilized. There was 135,000 critical comments that were submitted. There was multiple letters from members of Congress, and they had to postpone the criminalization. We have power in the sense that we're reaching out to police officers and firefighters with PTSD and offering them MDMA. And, and we had a police officer volunteer for one of our studies. So we can reach into the centers of power. We, we don't yet have power to, to get a government grant for MDMA research from the VA, although maybe that will come. But I think we, over the long run, we have an incredible amount of power because we have uh, techniques that touch the deepest parts of, of ourselves and others. We have the power, uh, well, we, we, we can marshal the power to heal. And that's what people are really in, in need of, and the power of spirituality. So I think we are um, capable of making this transition. I guess I want to wave the flag a little bit for psychedelics can change the world. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it will, but I think that it can. <laughs> and I don't know what else will instead. Um, I mean, so many other things will contribute, but I think we are in no way powerlessness, and I think the activism to, um, to be motivated by our psychedelic experiences, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that's um, clear to me, at least, is this whole... Um, you know, fear about the refugee, fear about the others. And I'm just so reminded of um, World War II when Jews were trying to escape from Europe on boats and, you know, they wouldn't be let in to countries and they had to go back. And that same is happening again. So, you know, do we have the power to address the fears and anxieties in our culture that are producing these kind of reactionary approaches? So far, not yet. But we'll see, you know, in the months to come after the election, maybe changes can happen. So I think if we're patient and think long term, um, we have incredible power, but it's only if we get activated and it's only if we try to reach out, not just to those of us who are um, in agreement, but to those that are in disagreement or skeptical. And that's really where our power will come from the most, by reaching out to where those pockets of fear and anxiety are and try to address them in whatever ways we can. I, I want to say that I think that this link is totally fundamental. I, 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 don't, uh, I, I don't imagine my own experience without the link between activism and psychedelics. And I think we, we can look a lot in the LGBT movement as a kind of example, because I think that if you compare gay rights and rights of users, the, the, the topic of drugs is still a huge taboo. I mean, you can go to, to the basement of Holiday Inn and have a, a whole convention on sadomasochist uh, rights and, uh, you know, teaching people how to whip each other and do all kinds of things. And uh, when it comes to, to, to drugs, it's a kind of childish topic that people are laughing, <laughs> like if you were talking about poo when you're kids. It's very childish. Uh, the level of the public discussion is very... Um, uh, superficial and it's like you're talking about something between funny and and kind of exotic so I think it's our obligation to advance this and what I do is when I'm I'm feeling you know my my morals down I teach myself by watching some really bad uh, you know like now I attended the the march in Guadalajara where I live which was the march in favor of the family and children, and I went there. And, but actually, it's an anti-gay march. There were 50,000 people, and my friends asked, why did you go there? Are you having some masochism? And I said, no, I'm, I'm going there to teach myself to be a better soldier, because I think if you look at what people do and say, that's where you get your strength, you know, to combat ignorance and prejudice. So we have to... Thank you. Well, your question made me think of something that uh, Bob Jesse said in his talk earlier, in which he asserted that essentially um, the medical research agenda is the only agenda that is worth moving forward at this point, and that essentially would be counterproductive to uh, advance any sort of political agenda outside 
of a medical approach. And honestly, that doesn't really sit very well with me. I think that is a ethically dubious position. Um, and I also think it's just politically wrong as an analysis. Change doesn't happen in a linear fashion. Um, change happens because lots of forces are coming at a problem from lots of different angles. Um, and if you look at, for example, with marijuana research, um, it's, it's only been once there's been a very strong political movement uh, that marijuana research has started to open up now. Um, and I think it's also a disservice to uh, present a caricature of legalization that um, relies on you know patent medicines. Um, we have decades of really excellent public health research to go on to know about what works about regulating drugs and not regulating drugs. Um, tobacco, for example, the most addictive substance there is, use has been cut in half over the past two decades. Um, and this is perhaps the greatest public health success of our country, and they were able to reduce use of the most harmful, addictive substance there may be without arresting or criminalizing anyone. Um, and so I think it's important for us to remember that political reform and policy reform is, is not always linear. Um, and that, it, of course, none of us want to see psychedelics get subjected to absolute free market capitalism, but that is part of our fight. That is going to be our fight in our lifetimes, is not just you know, whether these things become accessible potentially, but how they become accessible and who benefits from that. So, uh, may I respond? Absolutely. Um, first of all, thank you. You gave me direct feedback. And I appreciate it. For it. <laughs> and it's not all easy to hear. And I will take it in. Second, uh, you quoted me as saying that the only, I think that was the word you used, the only way forward is the clinical research model. I don't think I said that. If I did, I'd take it back. That, that, was, that, that was what you seemed to imply. You said that you don't think other agendas are going to be able to succeed in the next 10 years. And I don't so believe I said that either. Uh, and if I did, let me take it back. And, and let me course correct a little bit. Again, I'm, I'm really trying to take this in. The path ahead with the clinical applications to me seems to be the most straightforward. It's the most well-marked. It doesn't rely on polling. It doesn't ever get put to a political vote. There's no popular vote on it. Learned people make the decisions at the Food and Drug Administration and elsewhere. So it's an administrative process and it's pretty straightforward. MAPS and Hefter and USONA seem to be very well equipped to do that. I hope I did not say that work on the other fronts is a wrong thing to do. What I hope I said, and think I did sort of, is that I hope that those other efforts don't create turbulence that would slow down what appears to me to be the most straightforward track. So that's not saying don't do those other things. It's just saying, my opinion, which I own, I hope it doesn't delay or mess up what seems to be the fast track. And I'm all for cultural education. I'm all for uh, Bia's notion that talking about drugs generates giggles uh, the way, you know, sexual matters did not many decades ago. Uh, I'm all for changing the agenda and there are more skillful ways of doing it and less skillful ways of doing it. And I would just ask that everyone spend a little extra time thinking about the possible unwanted consequences of any kind of activism you engage in. And, and, and again, thank you for the very direct feedback. Um, I want to follow up quickly on one thing that you said, and this is not meant to be kind of argumentative or anything like that, but um, I just kind of want to just put out there that, that, that yes, we have, we are very fortunate to have these funders, to have Hefter and MAPS and USONA, and they are doing a, a lot of, of work for, for us in the research world and allowing us to do any of these studies. Um, but I mean, one thing that I want to make kind of clear to, to anyone out there that's, that's not super familiar with um, the kind of process of science is that 
don't get me wrong, these results are impressive. They're, they're beautiful. Um, we're very fortunate to be able to do these studies, but quite frankly, in the scope of science that is done, um, we are peanuts. The, the amount of science that is actually done out there and the amount of clinical trials and developments that are made, this is so small. Um, I mean, really, like, you're looking at the field. And, <laughs> and that, like, that is, uh, not, not to sound exclusionary or anything, we would, we would love for everyone to come join us, um, but, but really, please, please don't think that, um, that the, the clinical research route is as nice as it, as it kind of sounds. Um, we do absolutely need more support. Um, and although these kind of clinical decisions, uh, the, the private funding doesn't come down to a kind of polling vote, that sort of thing, but politics absolutely has everything to do with what studies we are allowed to do and what studies we have money to do. Um, and while this is all very promising, don't get me wrong, we have a long way to go to catch up to the rest of science. In my clinical practice, I don't, I don't use psychedelics. I don't offer them um, at all. Please don't ask me. I don't. Um, people ask me all the time, of course. But um, I love getting people in my practice who are actively taking psychedelics. And what I say to them is I can't recommend it. I can't collude with you to break the law or anything like that. But if you're going to take psychedelics anyway, try to set it up so that you make an appointment with me the next day. <laughs> You know, and it, 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 more open, they're, they're just opened up. So, um, and this is with activism in a way, a deeper sort of sense. Um, so I had somebody come in who had taken MDMA the prior day and came in and had seen God, had a wonderful experience, true bliss, total God, saw God, forgave his father, you know, the whole nine yards, really. And he came in that day and told me about it and we discussed it and, you know, tried to think about integration, I guess. and. Um, that kind of thing worries me a little bit because it's so extreme. How do you really integrate it? And of course, the following week when he came in, he was the opposite. He was completely dissociated. He was anxious and, and very, very tense and literally dissociated from his body. He like was not in his body because he couldn't handle what he was feeling. And what he was feeling was the difference between the bliss of that experience, the perfection of seeing God, and then one week later, over the course of the week, going back to work, having the angry boss or the surly kids or the dirty streets and thinking about the contrast between those two extremes, the perfect bliss and the dirty world, it's in insurmountable. So what do you do? You dissociate. You try to suppress it because, and you feel very anxious. So as we talked it through, it, it, and the person actually who he'd worked with, um, the concept of the bodhisattva became the most useful tool. And this is what I mean by activism. Coming back into the world, once you've seen bliss, don't expect the world to be blissful. The world is dirty. Well, put your shoulders to the wheel with your fellow seekers and try to teach others. The bodhisattva comes back to teach others. And so um, in Buddhism, it's, you know, no one is enlightened until everyone, every sentient being is enlightened. And so um, that sort of activism, getting back involved in life, and, and, and being a bodhisattva, an activist, um, you know, help this individual, and I hope it helps you. Um, are there any other questions? Thank you. Thank you all for wonderful talks. Um, very informative, and also great questions from the audience. Um, I have a question. Um, this... Um, interest in psychedelic substances stems primarily from the thousands of years of um, shamanic use of psychotropic uh, plants, um, psychedelics, entheogens, whatever we'd like to call them. And uh, we know they're essential, but, and we know that most of shamanism is primarily two things, use of psychotropic plants and sound or music. There has not been enough of questions asked about the role of music or sound in this scientific approach. We still use the model from the 60s, giving someone headphones, lie on the couch, and then journey. Why is there such shyness from investigating sound and music? Thank you. So, it, as you say, at Johns Hopkins and many of these other research centers, we've adopted the paradigm from the 60s. There's no question that sound uh, plays a, 
a seminal and supportive role in the context of these experience. Is, what I would say is it's just a matter of complexity uh, to do the research. There's so many things that we need to uh, explore within the confines of, of these paradigms that have been developed. And, and the music and the sound is just is one of many, many variables. And the way science works, of course, is that you can only manipulate one thing at a time. And these expenses, these uh, studies are very expensive. So uh, we have a deep interest at Johns Hopkins in, uh, in music and sound. And as a matter of fact, uh, we're conducting, uh, we've done some survey studies of best practices among people who guide uh, psychedelic sessions. And we have people from, we're, commu uh, we're collaborating with people from our Peabody Institute, that's our musical conservatory at Hopkins, to try to uh, determine what the nature of the, uh, the optimal uh, musical features of some of these pieces are. And then we're going to try to deconstruct them. But it's um, a long and tedious but very important process. I'd like to refer you to the work of Mendel Kalin. He's in Robert uh, Carhart Harris's lab in, in Imperial College London. This is an area of, of particular interest for him, and he's been doing some work related to some of the studies they're doing there with neuroimaging and looking very closely at the use of music from a scholarly perspective. So. I'd like to make a comment that's not quite about um, the scientific study of music and psychedelics, but maybe an anecdote from uh, the MDMA training, which I found interesting, which pertained to music. So in the studies with uh, MDMA for PTSD, uh, anecdotally, you know, we observe, maybe there's some science behind it too, that there's a sharp increase in anxiety as a response to um, the MDMA kind of coming up for the first maybe 60 minutes. And um, in the therapy, often soothing music is mo mo uh, used uh, to, um, the idea is that the anxiety maybe at that point in the, the dosing session, it might not be that useful. And then later on, um, the music changes and it has maybe a more tempo or more sort of activity to it. And uh, the idea is that if anxiety comes up uh, in relation to the music or onto its own, that's not meant to be uh, avoided necessarily, but maybe to be felt into. So my point being that not only you know, is there this question of well, how maybe can music uh, feed into or influence a mystical-like experience or something like that, or what is the most... Um, sort of compatib compatible music. But the other thing to think about is, you know, how is the music being used, both maybe by the therapist and also by the participant, right? Because I could also imagine a scenario where a participant is sort of focused on the music and wanting it to be different in, uh, in the spirit of maybe like avoiding something or maybe to stay distracted from something that's going on inside. So um, there are a lot of different factors and a lot of different things to think about in terms of how music is used therapeutically. Can I, can I say one more thing about music while we're on the topic? Um, first of all, I, I want to say that I think a lot of us up here are very, very, very interested in, in the concept of music um, with all of these things. And, and I want to follow up on what Roland was saying about um, we would love to do some studies on music, um, but we are really limited in, in the amount of studies that we're able to do given the funding that we have and the resources and the personnel that we have. Um, so we're kind of just doing our best to pick um, what we think are the most feasible and the most um, like immediately necessary things to study right now. Um, but that being said, I am super interested in music. Um, it's very related to memory. I don't know if any of you guys are following any of the Alzheimer's disease, dementia, music um, studies that are going on right now. Um, it's also really, really related, in my opinion, to our, our perception of time as it passes. Um, and time is another uh, construct, I suppose, um, that has come up a lot in some of these, uh, these talks. Um, and, and there is a, a good deal of involvement in, of music in all of these different um, research studies and other sorts of things going on around the world. Um, and if, if anyone out there is, is interested in, in collaborating on a music study, we, we, we need the resources, but we would love to do it. Other questions? Um, thank you all very much, for starters. Uh, I wanted to um, invite a kind of a reflection on psychiatry and the medical model connected to that. Um, 
I've been trying to put this puzzle together about the model psychosis theory for a while, this theory that has long connected since at least the 1920s, the interest in um, psychedelics and um, psychiatry, uh, the idea of them producing an experimental psychosis. So on the one hand, like, I feel like that's kind of fed the anti-psychiatry movement, the idea that, oh, you know, these psychiatry, th these things don't exist. On the other hand, it's fed this kind of criminalization sort of thing, these drugs are dangerous, they're producing a kind of temporary or permanent psychosis. Um, then Roland, yesterday, I think you mentioned how we can start to show how these experiences are part of normal biology. And it sort of signaled to me like maybe a kind of a shift away from this idea of associating psychedelic experiences with pathology. And so I was thinking about Tom Insel a couple of years ago, talking about how the whole DSM project has failed. We need a new one. And this RDOC that it's replaced with, formally, I think, like some of us might know what that entails. But I also thought it's a kind of opportunity for us to rethink psychiatry or the relationship of the experiences we produce to, to this medical model. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on that. Thank you. Uh, any of you? You know, these psychedelics are such remarkable substances and they probe consciousness, alter consciousness in uh, ways that are just unfathomably complex and dependent on certain settings. So you're right. And initially, they were thought to be uh, tools for studying psychotic process. Over time, we've found a set, uh, 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 a range of set and setting conditions to optimize these very positive experiences. Um, we, uh, the Steve Ross and the NYU group, and and our group are about to publish our papers on end of life. Uh, anxiety and depression and cancer patients, that, that does hold the potential for, uh, uh, for having broad implications for uh, psychiatry, not only end of life, but for various other kinds of uh, conditions. So uh, the whole thing is, is very malleable. And I, and I think undoubtedly there are going to be other characteristics of these uh, substances, how they alter consciousness that are going to provide unique windows not only into psychiatry but the nature of consciousness, the nature of spiritual experience. So this is, um, <laughs> this, I, as, as I've said sometimes, uh, I feel kind of like Rip Van Winkle as a scientist, you know, these, um, these drugs were taken off the table for research for decades and now there's so many questions to ask and these are such interesting compounds. Thank you. I just wanted to add something about uh, thinking about psychedelics and psychosis. Um, psychedelics can create psychotic like states, there's no doubt about that. In fact, the drug models that have been used to understand psychosis, the first was mescaline in the 20s. It was the first to be described as a drug type of psychosis model. But then there was amphetamines, which led to the discovery of the first um, typical antipsychotics that blocked the D2 receptor. Then in the 90s, you had the NMDA antagonists like ketamine PCP that was actually the best drug model of psychosis, reproduces all the symptom clusters. And then recently, the last decade or so, you've had the cannabinoids contributing to understanding the etiology of psychosis. So it's interesting, all these different drugs can mimic some of the effects of psychosis. I work at Bellevue Hospital, so we see psychosis all the time. In fact, I first learned about psychedelics before I knew that they were anything in treating psychotic patients. The mind of the psychotic patient is altered in a, in a way that's horrible and you're trying to diminish their consciousness. And so um, psychedelics are definitely not for everyone. They are not for patients that have psychotic spectrum illness. They can worsen it. That's why we try so hard to rule out those type of patients and to be careful not to uh, occasion psychosis in someone who's vulnerable or to certainly make it worse in someone who's predisposed. And the last thing I'll say to that, we're, there's a nomenclature problem we have in psychiatry. There's no such thing as therapeutic psychosis. Once you have an altered state, you give someone psilocybin and they have an altered state and you put them in a psych ER, they would say, oh, you're a psychotic. We don't have any way to understand therapeutic psychosis. I think therapeutic mysticism is as close as we can get. But psychedelics um, 
cause us to rethink these types of altered states and how we as a culture and psychiatry as a profession define them as pathological or potentially therapeutic. So I think it's an interesting and complicated thing to consider. I want to thank you all. Um, wouldn't, how many people here would like to stay for another hour and do more of this? I certainly would. I, I, I don't know if the panelists are, are ready for that. But um, we can't do it. Of course, we have to get out of here. We have a deadline. Uh, it was teasing, but we all, it's a measure of our love and appreciation for what these guys have done um, in their careers and here this weekend, too. So uh, please, I'm going to read their names off in alphabetical. Alicia Danforth, J Jag Davies, uh, Rick Doblin, Natalie Lila Ginsberg, Ingmar Gorman, Roland Griffiths, Jesse Jarnow, Robert Jesse, Bia Labati, Catherine McLean, Sarah Menenga, Michael Mithoffer, Jessica Nielsen, Samantha Podrubarak, Stephen Ross, Ellen Spiro, Fred Tomaselli, Ken Tuffer. Can you believe we've had so many people? So thank you all so mightily for joining us. It wasn't started with a 10th year plan. One more photograph. It wasn't guys, started please. with a grand ambition. It was just an idea One that there photograph. ought to be this thing that didn't exist. And if you dream of something and you think the world ought to have it and it's not out there yet, you should go out, get the ball rolling and create it because you never know where it's going to lead. And finally, that this conference is really about people. The information that's presented is wonderful. But the most important thing and the reason that everyone really comes to this yeah. is to be in a physical room full of people who believe in the same things. So thank you all for coming. There's no conference without an audience.